Welcome everybody. My name is Angus Dawson. I'm Professor of Bioethics here at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. So in this second lecture, what I want to do is to explore and pick up on some of the issues that I covered in the first lecture and apply them to a particular example. And the example that I've chosen to focus on is thinking about many of the chronic diseases which are often correlated with various lifestyle choices. And the specific example that I've chosen to focus on is that of those associated with obesity, such as increased rates of diabetes, certain kinds of cancers, heart disease, etc. We could, of course, have looked at things like smoking or drinking alcohol. Many of the issues that I'll be talking about may, may well apply to those examples as well but we'll leave that for another discussion. So when we think about uh, chronic disease, it's important that we don't just focus on individuals and clinical care. And essentially what I want to do in the second video is convince you of that by looking at some reasons why, when we're thinking about uh, chronic disease, we should be looking towards more public health activity. The public health activity is a way to reduce the, the risk or at best possibly prevent um, various kinds of chronic diseases from developing. So we never get to the step of treatment. So there's an argument for saying that um, at least some treatment of chronic disease is a result of failures in public health activity, because public health activity is seeking to intervene what we might call upstream in terms of seeking to prevent the disease actually emerging in the first place. What I want to do here is to explore four reasons to look to public health as being an um, important um, aspect of thinking about um, how to respond to, to chronic disease. The first one here is to think about the scale of the issue and the rapidity of change. Remember here I'm thinking, uh, prim thinking primarily about the issue of obesity. Secondly, I want to emphasize ideas to do with complexity. Thirdly, socioeconomic determinants. And I'll end by saying a little bit about why we might actually focus on population interventions rather than um, seeking to identify individuals for interventions. So on the first issue, so this is thinking about um, obesity and the scale of the issue and the rapidity of change that there has been at the population level. So the way I'm going to um, try and get this point across is to show you some maps that have been produced by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. And I think they demonstrate really clearly the issue to do with how we can demonstrate the degree of change year by year within a population. So here are the maps. I'm just going to run through these quickly. So we start here in 2011, 2012. We just have annual changes. The detail for our purposes here doesn't matter so much. Just notice how the colors are changing. And this is the final slide of 2022. So one of the things that I find really interesting about these slides and why I use them a lot is that they clearly suggest that something is happening at the population level in these particular states. There are different things going on in each of the individual states, no doubt, but the trend is clear. Rates of obesity, at least those self-reported in this particular study, and you would presume that people would, if anything, under-report their weight rather than over-report on what that is. Obesity rates are rising and they have risen very quickly. 
The second reason that I want to suggest why we might be um, looking towards public health here is that um, the issue of complexity in terms of mapping what the causal story might be for why these changes have happened. So here we're looking towards an explanation for those changes within a population. And what I want to suggest here is that it can't just be about uh, patients, individuals, choosing to act in particular ways. The way that those slides change over that relatively short period of, of, of time suggest, they almost look to my mind like a, the spread of an infectious disease. There's clearly something happening at the population level. And I think that it's going to be difficult to explain that by looking at the individual themselves, individual choices, individual autonomous choices. And we'll come back to this later on. So this is a slide, you're not supposed to be able to read the detail here, that's not what's important. But this is from a UK report where there was a, an exploration of the, what the potential causes might be for rising rates of obesity. And the, the message for you to take away from this slide is just notice all the arrows whizzing about this particular diagram. The thought is that if we're interested in thinking about obesity, how one individual's weight actually changes over time, then we need to see it within a complex set of causes. All kinds of things relating to taxation policies, um, food policy, um, the industrialization of food, agricultural practices, um, access to transportation, whether there's public transport or private transport, the changing nature of work in relation to most, most of us spend most of our days sat down in front of a computer rather than doing physical manual labor, as was more common in the past, etc., etc. So the complexity of the causal story here is something that is one that leads us to see that the focus purely upon individual food choices is at best going to be part of the story. We have to look at the decisions that are made about food choices within a much broader social, economic, political context. The third factor or reason to look to public health rather than just to individuals is to think about socioeconomic determinants. So you will have noticed that in those uh, CDC slides, there are differences between the states. And some of those differences might well be explained by different levels of um, socioeconomic um, affluence or poverty. But it's also important to see that there might be other factors at work which we can look to explain in relation to socio-economic determinants. And just as one example, I've chosen to focus here on ethnicity, and this relates to the last available information looking at non-Hispanic black adults in the US. And notice how the, um, the distribution, again, is, is different from um, the previous summary uh, slides. And some of this relates to ethnicity, and some of it relates to the correlation of ethnicity with um, issues related to poverty. So notice the uh, Wisconsin's a bit of an outlier there, but ma mainly this is an issue affecting, um, or is wor worse, in southern states in the US. And we can give a socioeconomic explanation for that. And the fourth reason why we should look to think about public health um, here is thinking about the nature of population interventions. And here I just quickly want to mention the work of a uh, epidemiologist, uh, Jeffrey Rose, and suggest or use his work to suggest reasons why 
there can be benefits to focusing on what we might call shifting the curve in relation to a population rather than just focusing on individuals. So here is a, a graph uh, from his work and you will see that on the graph here we have um, one axis is risk and the other is frequency. And essentially we have a, a, a bell-like distribution of um, the particular impact for the health condition that we're looking at. And one of the things that he wants to explore is how at least some policy interventions tend to focus on those at the end of one extreme of the bell curve. So essentially you're seeking to identify those that are at highest risk and then you intervene to uh, respond to those needs. Now he's not suggesting that we shouldn't necessarily do this. This is more a, a question of um, noticing what we're actually doing. What's the aim of the policy here? Are we seeking to identify those at higher risk and then intervening to prevent them? But notice that be, we need to be explicit about that's what we're doing. An alternative is to think about that distribution as a whole. Because if we focus on those at the highest risk, we are then ignoring the majority of people in the middle. And it might be that they are at less risk than those on the extreme, but they might still be at significant risk, and it might also be a risk that we can reduce. So we can move on to the second slide here to make it clear that if we're interested, for example, in shifting the curve for the whole of the population, essentially moving from curve A to curve B, you notice that there's an arrow there going from A to B. The idea here is that we can bring benefits to the whole of a population if we had a set of policies that were able to move from A to B. One of the examples Rose talks about is the idea of salt in the diet and how over time you might actually reduce the hypertension uh, cases within a population by reducing salt content. If you actually performed this carefully and subtly and did it sufficiently over time, you might actually be able to uh, do it without people even noticing, but it would have significant benefits to the population. So here we have a suggestion, reasons why it might be um, appropriate to think about are there any policies that we could introduce that move us from A to B? Maybe there are different kinds of regulations in relation to the salt content in food that we could bring in that would actually significantly reduce the risk of harm to a whole population rather than just focusing on those at the highest risk. So just concluding this uh, second video, I've chosen to focus on a particular example to pick up on some of the ideas explored in the first video. Thinking about the definitions of public health, this idea of focusing on the importance of populations, and also thinking about collective interventions as a means to improve the health of populations. Lifestyle choices are really interesting for a number of reasons and they are, I think, are a fit subject for, for using as an example here because of the way that our choices accumulate over time. We are influenced in our food choices by all kinds of factors, culture, tradition, commercial pressures, um, societal norms, etc. These are not one-off decisions. And therefore, there is more opportunity, if we are interested in effective interventions, to think about how we might intervene at the population level to, he to help individuals actually respond to um, improving their health over time. Of course, these questions are going to be contentious, 
But there are also reasons you know, looking towards the, the work of Rose as a potential justification, concerns about issues to do with equity in a population that provide reasons why we might take some of these ideas seriously. Of course, these questions are contentious and that takes us into ethical issues. And that's what I'll focus on in the third video in this series. Thank you and see you soon.